Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 13. I'm going to read uh, what Jesus says here, uh, but then I won't come back to it until the end of this message. But here it is, Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 13. It says, And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Verse 15, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Jesus often taught about uh, the kingdom, and when he did, some people were confused Uh, some people uh, were upset uh, that he taught about the kingdom. They just, you know, what is he talking about? We we don't get all this. Uh, Last week, I I started a a sermon on the kingdom of God, and I understand it, 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 you know, a few people kind of nonplussed uh, that I took on uh, this idea of preaching about the kingdom of God. Well, if you were one of those people, then get ready, because that was just part one. Today is part two on the kingdom of God. The last thing that Jesus talks to his disciples about before he ascends to heaven is the kingdom. It's in Acts chapter 1 verse 3. It says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The last chapter in the book of Acts, it tells us that Paul is in Rome and he's in a house paying for everything himself and he invited everybody who came and he taught them about the kingdom of God. It's right there in the text. Needless to say, the subject of the kingdom of God is important. It must be because not only is it in all the scripture texts, in several scripture texts, but Jesus himself talked about the kingdom of God. Now, as believers, as followers of Christ, we believe in the kingdom of God. We don't know everything about it. We don't understand everything about it. However, we are to know enough about it that it affects our worldview, it affects our living, and it even affects our dying because you believe in the kingdom of God. Now, by way of review, let me just share what I posited uh, the last time we were together. The first main point that I posited was the kingdom of God is distinct. One reason that kingdom theology is difficult for us to understand is because there's not really anything that we can sufficiently uh, compare God's kingdom to. Um, We use illustrations. uh, We use uh, parables. Jesus uses parables. He uses illustrations. Nevertheless, we in our humanness and our limited ability to comprehend and understand the divine things of God, we can't fully comprehend it. By the way, uh, and this is not just true for preachers, but it's true for any speaker, I'm sure, uh, that we use illustrations. You know, we, we use things and say, it's like this. But any illustration, when it's stretched out to the furthest point, breaks down. You know, I, I've had people come up and say, well, you know what, that illustration, you know, that was pretty good here, but, uh, you know, when have you thought about this? No, I didn't think about that because that's not what the illustration was about. It was just an illustration about this particular point that happens sometimes with the parables of Jesus. He, he's making a point for a specific item, a specific thing that he's talking about. And sometimes when you stretch those things out too far, they begin to break down. Well, the kingdom is one of those things where people were confused. Now, I said to you last time, the kingdom of God, as it pertains to heaven, is a locational reality. I draw it from the text. Uh, First of all, if you have a problem with that, you have to throw out some scripture text. Here's why. First of all, it tells us Jesus is from 
the kingdom of heaven. In John chapter 3, verse 13, it says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. That's Christ in his humanness. Or, or what about uh, John chapter 14? One of my favorites in the, in the first few verses, there are six verses where it says, Jesus says, listen, in my daddy's house, there's a whole lot of rooms. I know we used to sing, you know, Lord, build me a mansion in the corner of glory. But there's no scripture that really says that there's, everybody gets an individual mansion. You know that's an American thing, don't you? I ain't going to heaven unless I get my own mansion. You, you got a room. That's how it's translated actually literally in the Greek, which really says something. Because some of us as kingdom people, you know, we love Jesus and we sing songs, hallelujah and everything, but we don't get along very well. But, but, but there's a challenge here because in, in heaven, uh, you're going to all be in the same house, God's house. You just got a room. And if you act up too bad, I remember my son said to me, my youngest son, David, one time, uh, he was working. He was doing his little job. He's working. He was at Wawa working and everything. And he came home one day. And he said, you know what I'm thinking, Dad? I said, what's that? He says, I'm thinking I got it made. I'm making my little money. I got a roof over my head. I got a bed to sleep in. I'm okay. I said, that ain't your bed. <laughs> this ain't your roof. This ain't your house. You got to get your own. You don't want to get kicked out of the house. It says that there is a place where there are many rooms in heaven. Uh, thirdly, Heaven is where God's throne is. One of my favorite passages in, is in Revelation, uh, chapter 4. Here's some thoughts from it. In, in chapter 4 of Revelation, John, who gives, gets this glimpse, it's not allegory. This is the glimpse that God gives John of heaven. He says, after this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. In verse 2, he says, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. Uh, those are precious stones. Don't make the mistake. He didn't say that there was stones like this there. He says that's the appearance. He even says there's a rainbow around the throne that has the appearance of emerald. He's, he's using things that he knows in order to describe something that he has no illustration for. He's never seen it before. He says, and before the throne, uh, as it were, uh, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures. And, and day and night, and night and day, he says, they just keep going around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Not just that, but he was, and he is, and he is to come. Heaven is a locational reality. I also posited to you that the kingdom of God as it pertains to earth is a spiritual reality. You, you cannot see it with the physically, physical eye. You can't even enter it with the physical body. It's, it's uh, the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 who says to us, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot gain the kingdom of God. Um, in our present state of being, um, the physical is more real than the spiritual because we live in the physical. We see the physical. We can it's tangible. Uh, it, it, it's visible. Nevertheless, what happens in the spiritual has an impact upon the physical. Just look at yourself. If at one time you were a lost sinner or a person who was ignorant to the truth of God's kingdom, and then you come into the truth of that Jesus died for you, that he rose again, he paid the penalty uh, the, the, for your sin, a price you couldn't pay, and if you trust in what Christ did, then you are changed, you are transformed. That is a spiritual transaction. But it's evident in the physical as God's kingdom people are here worshiping together and singing together. What happens in the spiritual impacts the physical 
and the spiritual is actually more real than the physical. Second main point that I posited was the expansion of the kingdom of God is distinct. The, the kingdom is growing in terms of citizenship as souls are being added to the kingdom. But the kingdom is also advancing because God's kingdom agenda is not stagnant. God, God's plan, his kingdom agenda is not just sitting there until you decide to, to get with it or, or get on board or to become a follower of Christ. No, God's plan, his kingdom is active. It, it, it's always working. It, it, we can't see it because we see the physical. We don't see the spiritual. In fact, as God's kingdom people, we are to be actively living out our lives as kingdom People, meaning our behavior, the way we talk, what we do, what we say, uh, we should reflect uh, the will of the king of the kingdom. Uh, you know, I don't know if you noticed this, but um, especially in this church, and it's one of the things I'm extremely proud of about this church, is that when you look across uh, the landscape of the individuals who attend this church, there are people from different cultures, different nationalities, different backgrounds. There's a guy here who speaks five different languages. You know, so we have different languages, you know, different skin tones. And, and the question is, how is that possible? How do people, and let me just expand it beyond just this church, but the church universal uh, around the globe, there's different types of, of people, different cultures. Uh, the majority of the churches... Uh, especially in America, are really homogenous. You don't see uh, this diversity as either one group or another group or another, another group. But the fact is, is that we can come together uh, with all these different backgrounds and cultures and worship together. And, and I want to know, how can that happen uh, with, with unity and, and peace and mutual respect? How is that possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. It's possible because there's something greater than the color of your skin. There, there's something more important than, than your nationality. And don't, don't get me wrong. I am incredibly proud of my heritage. I'm, I'm incredibly proud of, of, of the, the gains and, and the victories that have happened uh, as I look at my grandparents who, who went through a whole lot of stuff because of, of racism and, and my parents. I, I mean, I'm incredibly proud of that. But, but you too, you, you have cultures, you have backgrounds, different wherever you're from, you, Ukrainian, you know, what, whatever it is, you know, we, we, we have all kinds of, Afghanistan, we have people from all over and you're proud of that but here's the thing that unifies us is that we are citizens of the same kingdom that that that's what causes us to come together so that we all worship together um, God's kingdom uh, before his crucifixion Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate asked him this question he says your own nation and the chief priests who have delivered you over to me They've delivered you to me. Now, what do you have to say? And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 18, verse 36. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Notice what he says. Bible study lesson. Look at what the text says. Don't read into it what you think is saying or you want it to say. He, he doesn't say that my kingdom is not in the world. He says it's not of the world. It's a reference to the source of the kingdom. The source of God's kingdom is not the world. And thank God that it's not. This is what John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. We had to memorize this verse in, um, in, when I was in Bible college. We, every uh, week, we had verses that we had to memorize. At the end of the week, we had to do those verses verbatim with punctuation. You, you had to write them out, and you had to choose which version, translation of the Bible you were using, and so that when you got graded, if you missed a comma, you got marked down. Uh, and I did that, you know, was, you know, for all those years. I don't remember this verse, how to write it, you know. <laughs> 
But here it is, 1 John chapter 2. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. One reason that it looks like the kingdom is not having a visible impact on what's wrong with the world is because the people who are supposed to be kingdom people in the world and who are praying for God to change things in the world have slipped and become so much like the world that they're not having an impact up on the world. God's kingdom has an impact on the world when God's kingdom people stand up and stand against and speak out and live their lives like kingdom people. Once we become uh, citizens of the kingdom, it's very difficult to live as part of the world. Um, There seemed to be a trend, and I think it's still going on with people wanting to go into outer space. Elon Musk finances people going into outer space. Um, you know, who's the, who's the guy for uh, Amazon? Uh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos? Yeah, who's the guy with Virgin Airlines? Um, uh, Richard Branson, is that his name? Richard, yeah. Spending all that money so that people can go in the world, uh, go up into outer space. Now, before they go up, it doesn't matter how much money they have, they have to get some training. Uh, so that they know how uh, to deal with outer space. And, and when they get the training, um, that, that's going to help them to survive while they're in outer space. So, so they send them up in a compartment that is filled with oxygen from Earth. They're going into outer space, but they have to have oxygen from inner space in order to survive. Because if they try to survive in outer space without oxygen from inner earth, well, you're going to die. We as kingdom people live in this space, but this is not our home. We need oxygen from our home in order to survive in this space. The oxygen is provided to us through the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is our oxygen so that we can survive in this inner space, even though we are members of the kingdom of that space where God reigns and rules. As kingdom people, we are to conduct ourselves as people who follow the king, recognizing that our survival depends Upon his Holy Spirit, which gives us the oxygen to be able to breathe. The Holy Spirit is our oxygen. That's why he said, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to leave you some oxygen down here in the form of the Holy Spirit. So, So you won't be destroyed. There are people who are comfortable breathing the oxygen of the kingdom of the world. They, 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 they don't believe in God or they've rejected God or they have yet to come to know him. And so they're just breathing the oxygen of the world and, and, and they're fine with it. But man, once you come to the place where you realize, you know what, it's kind of like uh, being in a smoke-filled room. Some of us, you know, we're, you know, some of you old timers, maybe I shouldn't say that because I guess then I categorize myself there because I remember this. When smoking was, that, that was the thing. In fact, all the actors on television smoked because it was cool. You know, you, you, you wanted to smoke because it made you look good. And so being in a smoke-filled restaurant was, was no big deal. And, and I love, they used to have a smoking section in the restaurant. There was no wall dividing it off. It was two tables over. And you're sitting there choking, you know. Oh, 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 well, we're not in the smoking section. That's the smoking section over here. But your smoke is over here in the non-smoking section. There's people who get, you know, you would get used to that. That, that was just the way it was. There, there was no uh, non-smoking restaurant. 
And so I'm glad that that changed, but we were flying, I can't remember where we were flying, Cynthia, and uh, we stopped over in Germany, and so we were sitting waiting to catch our next flight. And so I'm sitting there, and there's this room in a glass, you know, it's all encased in glass, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm saying, man, you can hardly see what's going on in that room. What, is, what are they doing? What are they smoking in that room? You know, it's clouds of smoke there, you know, but they can go in there, it doesn't bother them. And that's what happens uh, with people who have not come into the realization there, there's some clean air. There, there, there's some air that you will breathe that will fill your lungs and, and change your life. It's the air that comes when you give your life to Christ and his Holy Spirit infills you. That, that's who we're supposed to be as kingdom people. The destruction... The, 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 the things that we see, the sinful things that we see, make us feel as if, because I've said to you God's kingdom is advancing, they make you feel like the kingdom of the world is advancing more than the kingdom of God. The, 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 the sinful thing, Jesus himself says you're going to see wars and rumors of wars, so we see wars, it's like, mm, Jesus said that's going to happen before the end. Um, what is it, 2 Timothy, th- third chapter, um, it was another chapter that I memorized for whatever reason, but it says that, that there will be uh, an increase of, of wickedness and, and sin and evil people and that men will, will love pleasures more than they love God. And, and when you see that, you, you almost feel like that the kingdom of sin and wickedness and the world is advancing and expanding more than the kingdom of God. And even when you see these things, the end is not yet. Because the end comes at God's appointed time. Nevertheless, we have a guarantee that the end will come and that Christ will reign. Third main point that I posited last time was the ruler of the kingdom of God is distinct. That The term kingdom of God really refers to God's authority. That's really how it's defined. Here's what one preacher uh, at a church in Woodbridge, Virginia called Calvary Baptist Church. This is what he says. He says, the kingdom refers to the comprehensive rule of God over the universe and everything in it. And, and there's, uh, what would I call them, phases. Uh, there, there's divergent phases to the kingdom. Uh, I didn't make this up. I'm drawing it from the text. First, it tells us, God rules everything. You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They created everything. So the first phase is God rules. But then it tells us in the scriptures that he passed that over to Christ. And Christ rules. And Christ adds to the kingdom. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, people come to faith in Jesus. And the kingdom is expanding because more souls are being added to the kingdom. But then it tells us that there will be an appointed time that the son, after expanding the kingdom, will hand rulership back over to his father, and then God the father and God the son will co-reign. Then I said last week, because I'm still in review, this is going to be a long message. No, it's not. Then I gave you, I told you that I have three closing statements and that each of those closing statements have three subpoints. And by the way, each of those three subpoints also have some words underneath each one, so uh, sit tight. Here's the first one I gave you last week. Three ways in which the people of God respond to this kingdom. It's three ways in which they can respond to the kingdom. Number one, people can seek the kingdom. And I shared with you last week that Joseph of Arimathea, who, who asked Pilate, for the body of Jesus, took him down from the cross, put him in the tomb. It says, this is how it describes him. It says, he was a man who was seeking the kingdom. He was looking for the kingdom. So people can seek the kingdom. There, there are churches uh, ordaining people who are confused about their sexual identity. Watch out, you're on YouTube. Somebody can get a hold of you, Pastor Victor. I only... Uh, I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says that God made two genders. 
And, and, and so there are churches that ordain people, <laughs> some genders we ain't never even heard of. There, there's, there's some stuff that, that, that I find out, because for some reason I'm behind. I didn't think this would happen. You know, I thought I was pretty hip, pretty cool, pretty in tune with, with everything. And, 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 and as a musician, as a guy who loved music, I always knew what was happening in music, not just Christian music, man. I, I knew music. You know, I've, got, I've got, you know, over 300 CDs sitting in my garage telling you that so that when I have a sale, you can come and buy some. Um, I, I mean, I've got everything, you know, and, and I just thought I would always be up with it. Um, David and John, uh, who are here, our worship, uh, the director of worship, and John, the associate pastor, sometimes they talk to me about music, and I'm thinking, I, I never heard that. I, I didn't know he made another album. I didn't know she was still singing. I thought she was dead, you know, stuff like that, you know. And I'm starting to realize I'm, I'm not in tune. I, you, you seniors did not warn me that there would come a time when you know, I couldn't be up on everything. And, and I didn't recognize this either. I didn't know this would happen. I don't care. <laughs> You know, I mean, you get to a point that's like, you know, other stuff is more important. Yeah, I don't got to, you, you ain't giving me any of your money. You know, why should I care about what album you put? You know, I, I love, the, don't get me wrong, but um, it's just strange to me. And so uh, this whole thing of gender, there's stuff that people were telling me and it's like, a what? A what? Wait a minute. I mean, you know, you know, you know I, I said to one person, they were on, I should cut this out, you know. But I said to one person when they were asking me about that, I said, well, what do you see in the mirror when you get out of the bathtub naked? I might have a clue as to what you are, you know. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Because <laughs> I was getting a little worried. I didn't get a lot of amens on that. It was just, <laughs> I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> Let me get it. Did it work? All right, edit that out, guys. Uh, right? <laughs> okay. Because I'm a scared. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I, I lost my place. Uh, but there are churches that do that. There's, there's a surge of disharmony with, with, within the church. There, there, there's a, an increase of dysfunction and conflict within the church. And what I'd like to suggest to you that the reason that all these things happen is because people are not seeking the agenda of the king of the kingdom. They're seeking their own agenda. And when we do that, we get off. Um, um, people can seek the kingdom. Secondly, people can reject the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 23, interesting verse, Jesus is talking and he says, I might have it here. He says, um, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. And, and the primary way that people shut the door of the kingdom is through religion. Instead of preaching a relationship with Jesus, they're preaching a religion. The kingdom of God is not ritual and, and, and vestiture. The, the, the kingdom of God is not religious articles and, and icons. The, the kingdom is the governing of a king over his kingdom. And he is governing over his territory, impacting it with his will, his purpose, and his agenda. The kingdom is governed, governed by the will of the king and not by the will of his subjects. We're the subjects of the kingdom. You know, how come God did it that way? I don't believe that a good God would send uh, people to hell. He don't. You choose to go. You don't have to go. You know. But you're not the king. You don't make the rules. You don't determine how it happens and how it works. This is the God of the universe. How dare you tell him how he's supposed to do something? And so uh, we have to be careful. People can reject the kingdom and, and these religious leaders come into play and, and they cause people to miss the kingdom. The true subjects of the kingdom should not say, my will be done. It's thy will be done. Third way that people can respond to the kingdom is people can become citizens of the kingdom. Jesus himself says to Nicodemus, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of, of God. 
I love what Tony Evans says. Tony Evans says, the kingdom agenda is the visible demonstration of the comprehensive, comprehensive rule of God over every area of life. As kingdom people, we are to reflect the culture and the will of the king. That's why we can come to the place and have all different backgrounds, all different histories, uh, all different experiences, and we can worship together. Because when you do that, you are reflecting the culture and the will of the king. That, that's why when there was all kind of racial stuff going on all around us, and, 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 and a lot of it warranted, a lot of it not warranted, but in this church, we didn't fall apart. We, 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 we didn't all of it. I didn't come in one Sunday and, and get up here and say, hey, welcome to Calvary. And all the white people were on one side and all the black people on the other side. And, and everybody who wasn't white or black is in the middle. So we got Asians, Latinos in the middle. They're like, we don't, we don't belong to East. Where, where are we going to sit, pastor? You know, like, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. For one thing, I ain't going to allow that to happen around here. Don't bring that racism and that junk into this place because we'll shut it down that is not the kingdom of god that is not the family of god we are the family of god and we are supposed to behave like kingdom people all right that's my review now the new stuff you know, when I was writing this message and I thought I got to do a little bit review and then I went over and I was like, whoa, that's like uh, 40 minutes. Now I got another 40 minutes for the new stuff. So I cut down, the, I cut it down. Here we go. New stuff. This is the second of my three closing statements. Three aspects of citizenship in the kingdom. Three aspects. Number one, we are citizens of the kingdom by choice. You choose you have to make a decision. There is this great author, and in his magnum opus, his magnum opus is entitled Every Day for a Year, Bible Thoughts and Interactions. He also happens to be one of our Bible teachers here of the adult classes. His name is Winston. This is what he, he writes. He quotes, those are members of his class, you know. I didn't know they were going to be in here, you know. <laughs> But, but, but he, he quotes an, an unknown source, and this is what he says. Ran across this and thought it was so funny. It says, be decisive. The road of life is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision. You see them in the street all the time. Good job, Winston. But that's the thing. You got to make a decision. To be a member of the, of the kingdom, you got to make a decision. God ain't going to force you to be part of his kingdom. You have to make a choice. And if you don't make a choice, you're going to get run over. You're going to get flattened by the kingdom of darkness. Make a choice. Citizenship in the kingdom is a decision. Here's the second one. We are citizens of the kingdom by faith. Now go back to that that, that, that incident with Jesus in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 14, it says he became indignant when he saw that they were trying to keep the children from him. And he says, don't hinder them because for such belong the kingdom of God. I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter. Him. And then he, he puts his arms around them. Now, don't read into that something he didn't say. He didn't say, you know, the kingdom is mostly made up of children. It's not what he says. He doesn't say, you know, the kingdom is overrun by children. He doesn't say, if you don't put your arms around a child and hug them, you're not entering the kingdom. Because I've tried to hug some of y'all's kids. <laughs> not every child needs to be hugged. No, that's wrong. that's wrong. It's not what he says. He is talking about faith. He is saying to become a member of God's kingdom requires simple faith. It requires childlike faith. You know, when we get older, um, you know, when we're young kids, we ask, why, why, why is this? Why, 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 why? And then we come to a place, you know, you're middle age and you think you've learned some stuff. And then uh, you got some people who still in their adult life ask, why, why, why is God, this? why don't God do this? Why, 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 you know? I don't know is the answer to a lot of it, but this is something that I do know. That in order to be a member of the kingdom, you have to have a faith that believes God wholeheartedly. 
that trusts God implicitly and loves God unconditionally. That's what he's saying in order to be a member of the kingdom. Here's the third one. We are citizens of the kingdom in both the present active and the future active. Our present active position as followers of Christ is we are members of the kingdom right now. We are members of the kingdom the moment that you receive Christ as your personal savior. Philippians chapter three, verse 20, we read these words. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. That phrase, subject all things to himself, that's kingdom rule. He will bring everything under his rule. And then it tells us later on he's going to give the kingdom, the rulership, back to Christ. Uh, We are back to the Father. We're citizens of the kingdom also in a future active sense. Right now, as citizen kingdoms, living on the oxygen provided by the Holy Spirit, even though we're in this space, which is not our home, still we have to be subject to the decay and, 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 and the things that happen in the world that are godless things. Uh, we deal with disease. Uh, we deal with death. We deal with all of the things that are the result of the fall, even though we are kingdom people, even though we have a guarantee that, that, that after this life is over, that, that to be absent from this body is to be present from the Lord. We, we, we are subject to all of the decay that happens in the world. Even though we're kingdom people, believing the oxygen provided by the Holy Spirit. But there is a future sense. There, there, there will be a time uh, when that other part of us, the body, uh, will be transformed. If uh, when you die... Uh, you, you, you had some kind of terrible disease that disfigured your body. You, you, you won't have to worry about it. Uh, I've seen soldiers, uh, when I was at, there's a, um, uh, a hospital in my hometown uh, where uh, I had a friend who worked there, and, and I went a couple of times, and, and I would see soldiers. There's a man on a gurney, and... and uh, he was happy and he spoke and he waved and she introduced me to him. The entire bottom half of his body was missing. Got, got blown off. There are people who have had uh, legs amputated and arms, lost arms. Saw a woman a couple of weeks ago. I was, I was looking at some ministry stuff and they were showing this woman all happy and, and, and worked in ministry and, and she held up her hand and her hand was missing. There will come a time You don't have to worry about where that hand is, where that leg is, where the bottom half of his body is, what diseases you had, because there's a time that is appointed by God when he will gather that body together. Some some people have been burned to the point that there was nothing left other than ashes. Some people decide to be, you know, cremated. That's okay, don't worry about it. Because there's a time when Christ comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where, 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 even if it's ashes, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be an unsaved person at that time. I don't know. I mean, we say it's a spiritual return or something. I don't know. But, but, but it, it, can you imagine being standing there when ashes start flying all over the place and you don't know Jesus? You start seeing arms and legs shooting up out of the gra- What, what is going on? And God is putting you back together transforms your body and then you'll meet the savior in the air only it'll be a new body a changed body because this body cannot withstand heaven it would burn up as it got close but he's going to transform our bodies so that it can withstand the glory of heaven all of a sudden we don't have to have the oxygen tank of the holy spirit on our back because we will be living with it. There's the Holy Spirit right over there. There he is. There he is. You know, we're in the same place. We have a present tense salvation that has made us citizens of the kingdom. But in the future, 
Our bodies will be transformed. We shall be changed. Got to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. When we're not all going to sleep, we'll, we'll, we'll be changed. The dead in Christ will be raised imperishable and will be changed. For, for he says, this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. That's the future redemption of our bodies. Got five minutes. Here's my final closing point. Three things to do while you're waiting for the kingdom. Three things to do while you're waiting for the kingdom. Because whenever I do a message or you hear something, you have to ask yourself, so what? What does that mean for me? How does that apply? Well, here's three things you can do while, you, while you're waiting for the kingdom. Number one, work for the kingdom until it comes. Paul says of his colleagues in Colossians chapter 4, he says, they labor for the kingdom along with me. Now, you, there's a lot you can do to labor for the kingdom. There's a lot you can do. I know some of you, you know, hey, you're here in church on Sunday morning. No, that's, that's just great. That's wonderful. Don't, don't get me wrong. That's just good. But, but there's other things you can do. You, you, you can help. You know, I'll be having a meeting this afternoon about children's ministry. Maybe you're not part of that and you just want to see what it's about. Uh, see if there's something for you to do. Uh, there's something for you to do. And, and, you know, you might say to me, you know, because I might come to you as I walk off this platform and say, you know what? Why don't you come and serve in the children's ministry? And you might respond, well, I don't know if God has called me to that. I don't know if I've been called to it. You know what I'm going to say? Uh, give me your cell phone number. I'll call you. <laughs> I will call you before I pull out of this parking lot. Then you will be able to say, I've been called. You know, <laughs> if God didn't call you, the man of God called you. That's close enough sometime. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, where were you, Victor? Secondly, something you can do while you're waiting for the kingdom is look for the kingdom to come. Where did I get that from? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So your question to me is, how do I seek the kingdom of God? Here's how it starts. First, seek the king. How do I seek the king? You seek to do his will. How do I know what his will is? Open up your Bible. There, there you go, sister. She held up her Bible. She knows. That's how you know his will. Seek that first. While you're waiting for the kingdom to come, here's the last one. Pray for the kingdom to come. Where'd you get that from? The Lord's Prayer. What does he say? He says, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. The kingdom is not a democracy. God's kingdom's not. It's not a republic. It is a monarchy and it is ruled by a king and we are to be the subjects of the king. That's the way we're supposed to live our lives. My understanding, and I don't know if I've got this totally right, so don't take this as, you know, doctrinal truth. My understanding is that there's at least two kingdoms. Kingdom of the world, kingdom of God and they are functioning and operating at the same time the kingdom of the world is influenced greatly by the kingdom of darkness he has sway over the hearts of men and so we see some of the most evil things in the world happening in the kingdom of the world because the kingdom of darkness has absolute sway and power in the world but then there's the kingdom of God which uh, Christ says it is advancing it is real it cannot be destroyed and what I suggested to you is that there appears to be a little bit of an overlap here because he didn't say my kingdom is not in the world. He says it's not of the world. That's not its source. So how is the kingdom in the world, Pastor Victor, if that's what you are positing? It is in the world in this gap, this overlap, because God's kingdom people are in the world right now. And while we are in the world, we are supposed to be an example, just a microcosm of what kingdom people are like and what it is to live in a kingdom. No racism. Even when things are raging all around outside, God's kingdom people can come into a place, doesn't even have to be a building, where they can come together and worship together and sing together. You know, we're, we're, we're not really one of those shouting 
uh, churches, you know, we don't dance, you know, and stuff like that, but we might think about it. When God gets so good and you can't be still. I remember when I took over, I'm out of time, um, this uh, as senior pastor, and I got so excited one Sunday just about preaching the word of God, and I still am. That's why I continue to do it, and I feel like it's what God's called me to do. I remember coming up here preaching, and, and I just got real excited, and I started hopping across the stage. You know, people were with me, brother. They were with me. They were like, oh, yeah, praise the Lord. And I started dancing across the stage. People went, what? <laughs> what? What done happened now? <laughs> where is we going now? That's not where we were, you know. It's like, get excited about God. Get excited that you are a subject of the kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom. That's right, a citizen of the kingdom. It's an exciting thing. It's a thing that binds us together. It's a thing that allows us to serve together. It's a thing that gives us hope that this is not all there is. That one day we'll be joined with the rest of the members of our family, the subjects of the kingdom, as we worship God together. In the meantime, seek first the kingdom of God and pray for his kingdom to come. Amen? Amen.